What I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is talk a little about waterfall development, um, then focus a lot on agile methods, agile approaches to software development, talk then briefly about software craftsmanship and briefly about testing in the context of software development at any rate. The idea, though, is a very, very simple one. Take some of the ideas from the world of software development, from the world of computer science, and apply them to your job of teaching children. And we'll look at some of the parallels between one world and another. Okay, so let's start with waterfall development. Hands up in the room who's still teach, who's teaching A-level or A2, ICT, computing, that sort of thing. Waterfall development still on your, on your specifications? Oh, good. So you know all about this. We won't need to spend very long on that. So what you have then is somebody, generally somebody very well paid, wearing a very nice suit, comes up with a set of requirements of what the new software product's supposed to do. Then other people, still typically wearing suits, meet together in rooms and design a way of putting those requirements into practice, other people, not nearly so well paid, very rarely wearing suits, have the job of implementing that design. We call those in, in that line of work programmers. And then we need to test that the thing works. Testing is really, really important. And then there's usually a sort of ticking things over, you know, and, make, and making sure that the seat carries on working and carries on being fit for purpose. That's the sort of maintenance side of that. And as you all know, that works incredibly well for large-scale public sector software projects such as the NHS. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so the parallel then is to take that and apply it to our world. And you get, again, large public sector projects such as coming up with a curriculum for computing. And you have somebody who has a very nice suit and generally sort of fairly geeky spectacles these days saying, we should have computing on the national curriculum. Other people meet in sort of rooms at the Royal Academy of Engineering or wherever and come up with a design for implementing that requirement. Other people, generally not often wearing suits, generally not so well paid, have the job of implementing that design. In our line of work, we call those teachers. Um, we, do, we do the verification thing very, very well, don't we? We place a lot of emphasis on the testing thing, the testing side of that, of ensuring that it does work, it does satisfy the requirements which we started with. And once in a while, we issue a service pack. Those of you who remember the QCA schemes of work, is that not like sort of scheme of work 2.0 or something, or the, 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 beat, no, the, the service pack for that? So there, I think there are parallels there. And of course, that works, as we know, very well for public sector software projects, and so must, must also be the best approach for public sector projects of other sorts, like computing curriculum. Of course it is. And then you get people like the former schools minister saying, well, you know, once it's done, it's done. Once we've got that scheme of work, that national curriculum there, surely we don't keep changing that. Teachers can just get their lesson plans right and put them through the laminator, assuming there's any teaching assistants left to do the laminating for them or they can do it themselves. Is there anybody in the room who's ever so slightly worried? about laminating lesson plans that they'll have for this September and just using those year in, year out. Okay, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Why? Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> recycling is absolutely fine. Why laminate them if you're just going to put them in the recycling? Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay, the first of, I hope, many interruptions. Okay. He's, he's he has been recycled or possibly reused. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Anyhow, so why do we have problems with that? Firstly, that we're working in a rapidly changing domain. And I know there are arguments that computer science doesn't change nearly as much as IT or digital literacy does, but nevertheless, it's a subject which is continually evolving. And we feel quite close to that cutting edge boundary, even in the school sector. And secondly, that the children we're teaching change year on year. And a lesson plan that works with one class may well not work with the next class. So there are issues with that. The idea, as I say, is a simple one. It's not so much the computational thinking, it's the computational teaching that I'm looking at. That the insights that you have as computer scientists, as programmers, as coders, as software developers, are ones which are uniquely useful in your job as teachers too. Teaching is an awful lot like project management, and project management is an awful lot like computer science. There are strong connections between these domains. So what is 
decomposition, apart from working from, a scheme, working from a national curriculum. We have these big statements in there. Let's decompose them into smaller parts and produce a scheme of work based on that. And let's take that scheme of work and decompose that into medium-term plans and decompose that into lesson plans. We cross abstraction boundaries as we go. The Secretary of State is not, believe it or not, interested in your lesson plans. He's interested, perhaps, in the National Curriculum Program of Study. But at that lower level, you have the autonomy over what goes on there. Look at the patterns. Look at what you do in all of your lessons. OK, the three-part lesson or the four-part lesson, or how many parts are we up to on our lessons now, is one of those patterns. There are other pattern languages, grammars that apply, languages, I suppose, that apply when it comes to constructing a lesson plan. What are you doing when you're planning a lesson other than creating a set of steps to get something done. Isn't that what we teach down in Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2 when it comes to algorithms? Isn't there a similarity behind between designing an algorithm to achieve something and designing a lesson to teach children something? So the idea, as I say, is a simple one. Let's look at this in terms of the Agile, agile methods, the Agile Manifesto. You have a very simple idea there that says that those who subscribe to the Agile Manifesto are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. Can't we subscribe to something similar to that too? We're uncovering better ways of teaching by doing it and helping others to do it. And through our work, we've come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contact negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Now, the things on the right aren't unimportant. They still matter. But the things on the left matter so much more. And if the Agile development crowd have got that in terms of the software development business, then surely we see it too. How many of us went into teaching because we were really excited about processes and tools and writing comprehensive documentation for our lesson plans, <laughs> and, you know, having those agreements with our learners and, uh, and their parents, and you know, sl sticking slavishly to the plan at whatever level of granularity you'd have it. How many of us went into teaching because actually it's the things on the left there that excite us about the individuals that we have in the room in front of us, that our interactions with them of not being quite so worried about the documentation and all of the planning and so on, but actually producing working knowledge in the heads of the young people who are sat in front of us, of working with, we don't call them customers, apart from possibly some of the independent sector, we tend to call them children or learners or pupils or students, but collaborating with them rather than negotiating an agreement, a learning con compact, and not being afraid to deviate from the plan, of responding to the questions that arise in the room, of I'm interested in, well, let's explore that. Aren't they the best of your lessons? And I'm sure my friend David Brown at Ofsted would see those as the great lessons, where the teacher moves away from the plan because of what happens in the room. Don't you think? So take those Agile ideas and apply them not just to software development, but to what we do too. So the Agile Manifesto crowd have also got 12 principles that underpin this. I'm going to talk about three of those. Build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. This notion of us stepping back from being the sage on the stage, you'll forgive me saying that down here, to being the guide on the side, of being the person who facilitates their learning. If you look at the root of pedagogy, it's not the teacher. It's the Greek household slave who took the child to the place where learning happened. And isn't that what we are really interested in, of facilitating their learning rather than necessarily being the ones who are controlling absolutely everything that happens? Provide them with the tools. Provide them with the motivation. That's crucial to this. And then let them get on and learn and teach themselves. And then maximizing the amount of work not done. Don't let your senior leadership team see that. Anybody who's on senior leadership teams, just, just move on. I'll let you know when it's safe to look back at the screen. Of concentrating on what really does matter and not on all of the extra stuff. I think that's why I think many of us in the room possibly get really frustrated with the systems in place in many schools, that there is so much extra stuff there 
that gets in the way of the stuff that really does matter, that simplicity of focusing on the things that really do matter, that are the important thing. And, you know, when it comes to lesson plans, I see it a lot with my trainees' lesson plans um, working at Roehampton of, of wonderfully constructed, really baroque activities where there's so much context provided that sometimes the learning just disappears with all of the lovely fluffy bits which is added on there. So yeah, focus on the, the core, focus on what really matters. And then spend time looking back and do this as part of the team that you're part of. So reflecting on what happens with your colleagues, with your wider professional network, and of course, with the learners in the class in front of you. You know, how many of you close your lessons with, so what went well, what could I improve the next time? I teach this material. How many of you close a unit of work with? Okay, what were the good bits? What are the bits that we need to move on with? What are the bits that I need, we need to improve? And thinking about the working practices in your classroom. The other agile principles I maintain also apply in our domain just as much as their domain do have a look at the website. And then thinking particularly to the challenges we face in implementing a new program study of introducing computing where we've only had ICT in the past. Let's just focus, at least for the first year, on getting the minimum viable project, product, the thing that works, the things that is at least good for the purpose that it, we have for it. And then let's see ways of improving that in an iterative cycle of saying, OK, we've got something that works. Let's now move on from that. Let's now take that a stage further. OK, other agile ideas. So, so, so there's more sort of principles. Now looking at some of the practices, you have this notion of the agile sprint. And I think the key idea to that in our domain is this notion of the time box, the time frame in which everything has to happen. Now, we have lots of time boxes that we play with, don't we? We have the two-year course leading up to GCSE or leading up to A-level. We also have the, the unit of work, the half-term plan. We also, though, have the lesson. And thinking of that as the time box, that in that time box we've got to get everything done. I'm talking, or in, you know, I'm aware of teachers in school who are taking some of these agile ideas and applying them in their classroom. But seeing each lesson as that time box, and at the end of the lesson, the children have got to produce working code. It's fine if your focus is on coding, of course, but having something to show for what you've learned there. The product backlog idea. Here's your specification. Here's the list of things that we have got to cover over the course of the term, over the course of the unit of work. Time box I've spoken about. During the period of the sprint where we're working on delivering whatever functionality, whatever meeting whatever requirements we have there, you start with the planning meeting. Isn't that like the introduction in your four-part lesson? We have an identified task from that product backlog. And then at the end of that time box, we have two reviews. One where we think about the processes and another where we think about the task of what we've achieved there. And then we have this notion of the scrum meeting. This, the scrum, of course, is the way of getting the ball back into play, which is a standing up meeting, 15 minutes if that. And you have these three questions which you answer if you're adopting this, this methodology. What have you done since the last scrum? What are you going to do between now and the next scrum? And what's getting in the way of doing that? Is that not a good way to less, run a lesson plenary, particularly when you're getting on with project work. What have you done? What are you going to do next? And what's stopping you from doing that? And isn't that a good way of, use, of running school meetings? You know, school staff meeting? Everybody stand up, address these three questions. What have you done since we last met? What are you going to do between when, what we, when we next meet? And what are the problems that you're encountering? And then you've got this pair programming idea from extreme programming. And, you know, d down in the primary phase, where most of my teaching career has been spent, we've made a virtue of what is, has often been a necessity. We don't have enough pooters to go around, so we double the children up. That's a really good way of getting really good code written. But you set up the rules there. So one person who's uh, part of the pair takes on the driving seat position. The other takes the navigator role. And that works particularly well, as we know, for coding. But it also applies, surely, for things like lesson planning, for things like creating a scheme of work, who in the room has got a partner, who's got a colleague with whom they can sit down and write these lesson plans and these medium-term plans. This is not a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not enough of you. Kaz is a great place to find these folk, yeah? 
If you've not got somebody in your school, then join up with the school that's near you. It was wonderful. Last session, hearing both Mark and Matthew talking about how they've shared ideas between one another and how their planning has improved through that process of having somebody to work with on these tasks. And then a little more about pattern languages, if you'll allow me, this notion of we have a common vocabulary, we have a common set of problems, and there are usually good solutions to those problems. So Christopher Alexander starts it with the problems which he encounters as a town planner, as an architect, and then the object-oriented crowd apply that to writing code. These are common problems. These, this is a good pattern to solve that. And then others have taken this notion of the pattern language and applied it to other domains too. So Hoover and Oshnai, writing about the process of becoming a software developer, of that craft apprenticeship. And this super book called Apprenticeship Patterns. The text there is all online for free. And then I think there are strong parallels between what they suggest for getting a job in the software industry and what applies for somebody who's entering the teaching profession, particularly today, where it's seen very much in terms of craft skill. And Diana Lollard writing a book that I would very much like to have written myself about thinking about the patterns that apply to teaching and this pedagogical pattern language. So sharing that is important. You know, these patterns work because you're able to share this sort of thing with one another. And so you have, in our domain, I suppose, this notion of the open educational resources. But many of those are very rarely do people take those open education resources and change them. I wonder if that's because we've not got the right tool for doing that. And something like GitHub surely is the place where we could be putting our lesson plans, our resources. So not only can you download the thing and use it yourself, but you can fork the project and change it and make something better from that. And it's lovely to see functionality in the CAS community site, which, which goes towards that end with sort of wiki-like tools. And if we had audio working, I'd show you Peps McRae talking about a project he's working on called Open Plan, which is exactly that. It's a GitHub for lesson planning. Wouldn't it be great to use that for some of the work that we're going to be working on as we move towards computing in school. Okay, so briefly now, at growing out of this agile development crowd, you have this software craftsmanship ideas, which starts with the agile manifesto, but goes further and say, okay, working software is fine, but well-crafted software is better still. Being responsive to the change is good, but actually it's not just about responding to change about going off on a tangent because the learner puts their hand up and says, oh, this is interesting because we have an obligation to do more than that about steadily adding value to our learners, steadily increasing their fund of knowledge, skills, understanding. And yes, do please get excited about the individuals in your classroom and your interactions with them. But don't forget that you're part of a community of professionals too, that it is more than just your classroom that your responsibility is to. So yes, collaborate with your customers your children, your pupils, but also think about the partnerships beyond your own school. And Richard Sennett writing about craftsmanship in general, and you can see how this applies so well to computing, to programming, of course. It's by fixing things that we often get to understand how they work. Isn't that right when it comes to, to learning how to program computers, to learning computer science? But isn't it also true in our domain? Think of how you've developed as a teacher and how so much of that has been because of the problems in the classes that you've been working with, not the successes necessarily. And Diana Lorillard's same book talks about this in terms of teaching as what she calls a design science, which I think is a more positive term perhaps than craft necessarily, that we as teachers should be continually improving our practice. But having a principled set of ways of designing, testing improvements in that practice and building on others' work. Again, coming back to that GitHub idea, sharing our experience with one another and representing their, their, their practice, the outcomes they achieve and how they relate to the elements of their design, the pedagogical pattern language, which she's very excited about. So almost finally, moving on to the whole testing thing, whose school hall looks a bit like that at the moment? Okay, must, must be more than a few of you. Um, you have the... This notion of test-driven development. Is this the same as teaching to the test when we move it into our line of work? I hope not. I think what we have there is this notion of there's no point teaching them things that they already know. So test-driven development says you create the unit test that fails. 
that doesn't succeed. And then you develop a bit of code until the test passes. I think if you take that idea and apply it to our line of work, then we have the children don't understand this at the moment. I teach this, and then they do. I think our friends at Ofsted would see that as evidence of progression during the lesson, which is something that they get very, very excited about. And then, of course, you've got the chance to refactor the code, to remove the duplication, to synthesize the ideas, to simplify them, to integrate that into that network of connections which constitutes their understanding. Um, more on testing. There's this, this lovely bit of work from Lisa Crispin talking about agile testing quadrants here. And she says you think about this in two dimensions. You think about testing in terms of the technology and also the business process for software. And you think about it in terms of supporting the team. And sorry, waving my hands the other way, and <laughs> critiquing the product. And what does that mean in our line of work? Well, down the bottom there, you've got the subject knowledge, the content of the curriculum. Have they learned these things? Up at the top there, I think, can you apply these things? Not can you, do you know this, but can you use that to make something better, to make something interesting? And then the other direction, you have that notion of the, the, the formative assessment for the supporting the team side of things, and then the summative assessment for have you learnt what you set out to learn in the end? And how do you measure this? Well, over on Stack Overflow, which has been mentioned at least twice already today, you have this sort of badge system going on, not just for what people answer, not just for when people contribute to that body of knowledge, but for the questions that are asked too. And there is interesting work going on in education in terms of using a badge system to, to, form, to give some sort of credit for particular knowledge, competences, literacies as children acquire those. And I think there are interesting parallels there. And finally, some space to learn in. One of these pictures is a primary school, can I say ICT room or do I say computer lab these days? One of these is a primary school computer lab. The other is an office space at a global tech multinational. Can you guess which is which? <laughs> Shouldn't they do the other way? Well, you know, okay, no problem with them having that lovely office space. But wouldn't it be nice if a few more of our computer labs, or if you want to call them ICT suites, looked like a few of Google's offices rather than call centers? You know, if you set the room up to look like a call center, then. You know, is it not just about end user skills? Let's move into a more creative workspace. Let's see computer labs that are a bit more like design studios and a bit less like call centers. If you don't have control of what your room looks like, then you can do it in the space of your pedagogy and moving the pedagogy from call center-like or typing pool-like to design studio like would be a good step in the right direction. I have overran. I'm very sorry about that. If you want to get in touch, there's an email address up on screen. There's a blog, which I very rarely have a chance to maintain these days, and I'm on the Twittery thing. These slides are all online, and there should be a recording of this shortly. Thank you very much.